Está pronto? Ok, so thank you for coming today. First session on Thursday. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Asun Jimenez from Anita Roy, UFF. She will speak on isolated singularities of Monjean Pair equations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, thank you to Diego, special, for the kind invitation to this PDE session. I must do aware of you that I'm coming from differential geometry, geometric analysis, but maybe the techniques, the geometric techniques I'm going to present may result interesting for this PDE audience. I don't know. Well, let me give you the sketch of the talk I'm going to to explain today here. First, I will give you a brief introduction about isolated singularities of PDEs. I will present the main theorem we are going to prove and give some preliminary uh, definitions that we are going to need later. Later, we are going to talk about the asymptotic behavior of an isolated singularity in a certain kind of PDEs, monion per equations, that is the kind of equations we are going to consider. And finally, we are, uh, we are going to give some comments on a more general class of monion per equations and give a brief uh, geometric application of our results. Okay. Uh, the reference is, it is not working. Okay. The reference is of, of the results, most of the results I'm going to explain here are contained in these two papers. Both of them are joint work with Jose Antonio Galvez and Pablo Mira from Spain. The first one is already published. It, it concerns the results on the pure monia per equation, the most simple one. And the second, the second work uh, talks about a more general uh, monia per equation and geometric applications. Okay. Well, let's start. We know that for many quasi-linear equations, as an isolated singularity is in fact removable, it doesn't exist, whenever the solution is smoothly enough close to the singularity. So if we impose that, the singular, that close to the singularity, the, solu the solution belongs to a certain sub space, we immediately can say that the singularity does not exist. That is the case, for instance, for the well-known example of minimal graphs that it graphs in the Euclidean space, which has mean curvature equal to zero. This is a divergence type quasi-linear equation. Um, by Beers, we know that an isolated singularity of this equation is in fact removable. Isolated singularities does not exist in this case. And this is also true for a more general class of PDEs, quasi-linear PDEs. Okay. Removability criteria does not only exist for this kind of quasi-linear equation, it also exists for a more complicated class of PDEs, the PDEs we are interested in, which are fully nonlinear monion per equations. And that is the, the topic we are going to talk about. Uh, the classical, the more well-known uh, monion per equation that we can consider is this one I have written here. Determinant of the Hessian of a certain function equal to a positive function. Okay, that the function on the right is positive uh, makes that the solution is convex, it is elliptic. Okay, in dimension two, the dimension we are going, we are going to work here, we can rewrite this equation, which is or originality related with optimal transportation problems and all this stuff, in this way here. Determinant of the Hessian equal to a, a function C, which may depend on the coordinates in a domain or R2, the solution Z, and the derivatives of the solution. Okay? Two, two simple examples of this kind of monion per equations are first, of course, the Hessian one equation, the most simple example that we may consider. Determinant of the Hessian equal to a constant, equal to one in this case. Or, for instance, the well-known equation in geometry, the equation of graphs in R3 of prescribed Gaussian curvature. If you have a graph and you impose that the curvature is equal to k here, a positive function, then the graph must satisfy this PD. Okay? Well, for instance, going back to the Hessian 1 equation, it is related with many topics in geometry. For instance, we, we can find it when we study flat surfaces in the hyperbolic space, we, it also appears related with minimal graphs in R3, also associated to uh, area preserving diffeomorphism in the plane, and many other topics. And this, this, well, this uh, 
classical result of Jorgen says that the complete or the entire uh, functions that satisfy this PDE, the functions defining the whole plane satisfying this PDE must be a quadratic polynomial. So the graph will be an elliptic paraboloid. If, if we want to be more, more restrictive or if we want to, to play a little bit more with this equation and we look for a more complicated, if we allow now the solution to be defined in the whole plane but with an isolated singularity, also Jorgens proved that the only, the, the unique solutions that there exist in this case must be rotationally symmetric. They are, they are in this way here. Uh, concerning the, going back to the, doesn't work? Okay. Going back to the case of prescribed curvature equation, if we look for, for a surface of constant curvature equal to one in R3, which is not a wrong sphere, the most simple example that we can find in this rotational peak sphere, like a rugby football ball. Okay, we cannot have solutions with only a singularity by Alexandra reflection principle. We have to have two symmetric singularities. Okay. It's really not working. Okay. Well, let me explain you what is what will be for us isolate and isolate singularity of a solution of a PD of a monoid equation. We have our pure monoid equation here, and we will say that a C2 solution has an isolated singularity if the solution has not a well-defined tangent, a well-defined gradient at a puncture in the plane. Okay, we take a domain in the plane, a point inside this domain, and if the solution has not a well-defined gradient at this point, we say that the solution has an isolated singularity. Okay, two trivial consequences of the convexity of the solution are first that the, the slope of the solution is bounded around the singularity, we won't have a cusp, the, bond, and the slope is bounded, and of course the solution will have a continuous extension till the puncture, okay, for this, this kind of solutions. We as we have said in the definition, we, we don't have a well-defined gradient, but we can define what are we calling the limit gradient of the solution at this puncture. With what it is, it is the set of all the possible limits of the gradient of the solution when we approach when, with some sequence of points converging to the puncture. Okay, this will be gamma, the limit gradient. And it is a limit of uh, convex curves, it can be Three only, three only possibilities. It can be a point, that is a point in the plane, a vector. If the solution, in fact, is regular, we have a well-defined gradient. It can be a priori a segment, or it can be a convex Jordan curve. We don't know a priori what it is, this limit gradient. Okay. Well, this is the, the main result that we went to prove along the talk. Suppose that you have a pure monion per equation, defining a puncture uh, in a puncture domain on the, pl on the plane. Here I, I recall you that the function on the, right, on the right may depend on the coordinates, the solution, and the gradient. Now, uh, this is the statement of, of the result. You pick a point in the Euclidean space, and you call M1 the class of all the solutions of this PDE with an isolated singularity on the projection of, on this, po of this point, and whose height at this point is this Z0. Z Okay, and M2, the class of all the regular real analytic strictly convex Jordan curves in the plane. Then, the map that sends from each solution into its limit gradient gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two classes. So, if you have a solution of the PDE, you will have a, a convex, strictly convex Jordan curve. In some sense, what you are saying, you have a limit tangent cone of the graph of the solution. And conversely, if you start with a profile curve which is strictly convex and you construct a cone, you can recover a solution of the PDE whose limit gradient at the point is exactly the curve you started with. Okay, it's more like clear. Well, I have to, to, to mention here that this result generalizes or recovers some previous result concerning the Hessian one equation here in 2007, and for the case of the graphs of curvature constant. 
Here, the curvature, or the curvature of the graph is not necessarily constant. It's every, every analytic function. Okay. You, you can forget, you maybe are asking yourself about this C2 here. We are, C2 is just uh, a restriction about the orientation of the graph. If you are considered the upper graph of the down graph, you can forget about it. Well, just, just a remark before starting the proof of the result. This classification theorem I have just passed is not true in general if we consider a more complicated monion per equation. Suppose that you have a more general monion per equation, that is, the determinant of the Hessian plus a certain matrix A equal to a positive function. Well, for this more general equation, the result is not in general true because we have some counterexamples. For instance, we can find solutions of this kind of equation for which the, the, the gradient is not bounded at the singularity. We have a, a cusp. We have not a bounded slope close to the singularity, so we cannot classify in terms of a tangent cone. Okay? Moreover, we can construct solutions of this PDE uh, starting with a curve which is convex but not strictly convex. These curves may have points of curvature equal to zero, but in, also in this case, we can recover solutions of this type. It's not possible in the pure case, in the classical monion per equation. Uh, before starting the, the proof of the theorem, let me give you some, some definitions on, or some tools we are going to use during, during the proof. The first important tool that we are going to use is the associated Riemannian metric to the solution. <clears throat> if you have a solution of the pure monion per equation, you can construct these two forms here in terms of the second derivatives of the solution. And it happens that because of the solution is elliptic, is convex, this metric here is Riemannian this two form is positive defined, okay? So here is the, the trick. We have a result of Hind and Bejested that said that if this is the case, if you have a real isolated singularity, that is if the solution is not uh, regular at the point, then the punctured disk you are working in, you are working on with this metric, this square here, has the conformal structure of an annulus. That is, there exists a conformal diffeomorphism from your puncture disk with this metric into a certain annulus. Okay? And that's the point. From now on, we are going to reparameterize our solution, or the graph of our solution, in terms of new parameters, u and b. In, we are going to forget um, for now from x and y. We are going to work with new parameters which are going to be defined in a certain street uh, sigma. Uh, up to a, an equivalence which is conformal to a certain annulus, a 2 pi identification. We take a strip and we make a 2 pi identification. This is an annulus. And we are going to define new coordinates in, this, in these domains. We can consider, maybe we can, it's easy for us to work here up to a 2 pi identification. Here, the red line, here the real, the real axis or the interior boundary of the annulus will be identified with the singularity. It's mapped into the punch. Okay? And this is what are we going to do. We are going to take our immersion of the, of the graph x, y, and z. Z is the solution of the monion per equation in terms of these new parameters u and v which are defined in this strip. And here the real line, the points with v equal to zero are mapped into the puncture. Okay? Well, this is uh, another important result that we are going to use. We call it boundary irregularity lemma. Suppose that your function, that, that, sorry, that your function C in the equation for the, for the beginning, only, we only need a certain regularity K bigger or, or equal than four. Then we can prove that this vector Z formed by X, Y, Z, P and Q, P and Q are the, the gradient of the solution are in fact of this order, not only in the domain we started with, but also at the puncture, at the real line, this red line I have, I have drawn before. Okay, we can extend in a regular way the solution in terms of these new parameters. 
the, the sketch of the proof of this fact is the following. From the PDE, from the monion per equation, we deduce that this vector Z satisfy this first order system. Okay? Then we can do a second derivation and obtain a well expression for the Laplacian of this vector field Z and doing some bootstrapping method and at the end applying some regularity, boundary regularity results of Mueller, we deduce that the solution, the, that this vector, sorry, must be regular also till the boundary. Okay, of course if, if, if we start with an analytic function here, we recover analyticity also at the boundary. This will be really, really important at the end. Okay, we want to prove that the limit curve is a Jordan curve which is regular and strictly convex. We are going to prove the regularity of this convex curve, the curve that describes the gradient of the solution at the punch. We want to see that there is no point of this red line in which the, the tangent of the curve is equal to zero. And we are going to prove this in uh, three steps. It's just a sketch of the proof. Suppose that you have your, your graph parameterized in terms of these parameters, U and V. First, we are going to prove that we have at most two singular points. At the end, we are going to prove we have any point. But let's start proving that we cannot have infinitely many singular points of this curve. Okay? Why are we going to have only two points at, at most? Well, first, observe that the real line is closed, is, sorry, is crossed exactly by two nodal curves of the function x. x is the first coordinate, the first coordinate of the graph. Why is this? Well, let me give you a picture here. You have your graph defined in a puncture disk on the plane. This is coordinate x, y, and z, the vertical one. You have your map, your conformal diffeomorphism, like, let's call it maybe phi on this strip, sigma, okay? And since this is a graph, if you cut it with the plane x equal to zero, if you make a cut here, it will give you two curves converging to the origin that will be corresponding here to two curves here. So the real line, which is mapped into the puncture, will be crossed by two nodal curves of the curve x. Okay? Well, the second, the second step will be to, to see that the Laplacian of this function x has a, well, uh, a nice expression. It is a function of, of the, the x itself and also of the gradient of x, of x such that if x is equal to zero, what happens along the real line, because the real line is mapped into the singularity, and the gradient of x is equal to zero too, then the right hand of the equation is also zero. So zero is a solution to of this equation, okay? Now suppose that you have uh, a singular point of gamma on this real line. Okay? We are going to suppose by contradiction that we have three points, three singular points. If we have three singular points, uh, uh, at each one of these points, the gradient of x is equal to zero. Maybe here, I don't know. So by nodal arguments, we are going to deduce that we must have a nodal curve of x crossing the real line at each one of this point. But this is a contradiction because we knew that we only can have two nodal curves. Okay? At each one of this point, we'll have a nodal curve of x, which is a contradiction. Okay? Well, to continue the proof now, we want to prove that we don't have any point, any singular point. We, we first see that if you consider the vertical hyperplane containing the, the vertical axis z and a certain direction, horizontal direction, we, we do a cut. So 
poses a certain plane and you cut your graph with this type of hyperplane, you will find a corresponding curve here. I will call it delta theta here, finishing at a certain point u theta. Okay, for each hyperplane, you will have the corresponding curve on your strip. Okay, suppose that you have a singular point, and you can choose, since you have a finite number of singular points at most two, we have proven at most two, you can choose a certain angle such that, such that this u naught, this singular point, you only have two, this u naught is not this u theta or the symmetric one, the corresponding to the symmetric plane. And now, what, we're, what are we going to do? We can repeat the same novel arguments before now for the rotated function x theta, and we also arise to a, a contradiction. This is more or less the same, the same argument we did before. Well, now we know that the curve is regular. We are going to prove now that it must be strictly convex. We don't have points of the curve where the curvature is equal to zero, okay? Well, now the trick use a little bit more of geometry. Suppose that you have your graph and you consider the second fundamental form of the graph. I recall here that the second fundamental form is a two form that in some sense uh, measure how the surface bent on R3, okay? It has this, this face here it is conformal, in fact conformal, to the metric ds squared I presented, I presented at the beginning. Remember that ds squared was formed with the second derivatives, and this is in some sense the second fundamental form of the graph. Here k is the Gauss curvature of the graph, q, q is this one form here, and rho, this, this function rho appearing here satisfies this nice equation for its Laplacian. Okay. Moreover, we can compute the transversal derivative of this function rho along the real line. It can be expressed in this way. Here, alpha, this function alpha, is the limit normal of the graph. At the singularity, you don't have a well-defined unit normal vector of the graph, but the graph, the normal, sorry, will de describe a certain curve on the sphere. Okay, this is alpha. And you can relate the gradient, the norm of the gradient of alpha and the geodesic curvature on the sphere of this normal with this transversal derivative of rho. So, as rho is different from zero here, because your graph is regular outside the, the puncture, is, rho is different from zero here, and it's zero along the real line, also by nodal arguments, we can, we can prove that this transversal derivative cannot be zero because in other case, we will have another curve of rho crossing the real line. So this normal derivative is different from zero, and since alpha prime is not zero, that gives you that the curvature is not zero, always. So the curvature of the projection of, the, of this normal vector, which is uh, gamma, or curve, or where limit gradient is also strictly convex. Working with the limit normal is essentially the same that working with the limit gradient. It's one is just the projection onto R2 of the other. Okay. Well, uh, let me now talk a little bit more, or give you some, some results about existence and uniqueness of solutions, not only for the pure Monopoly equation, but also of the general Monopoly equation. Suppose that you have uh, analytic data, a matrix, and a function which is positive, and you consider this PDE. Suppose that you start with gamma, this is the, th the system theorem. Suppose that you start with gamma, which is a real analytic to pi periodic Jordan curve, which is regular. Neg this negatively, negatively oriented is just a technical restriction, you will see later why, and strictly convex. Then you can construct a solution of this PDE, uh, which has an isolated singularity and such that the limit gradient of the solution at the puncture is exactly the curve you started with. Okay, in some sense you are, you are starting with a convex cone, you can construct a solution 
Okay. Let me, let me give you a sketch of the proof of this. The first step will be to, this is just a line, to describe the, the, this awful uh, equation before in this way here. Here are the coefficients, A, B, C, and E may depend on the coordinates, the solution, and the gradient. And also from the equation, you can deduce that this vector, x, y, z, and the derivatives of z satisfy this first order system. You take the initial data for this first order system here. Zero, 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 that is you are mapping the real line into a point in R3, the point zero, 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 the origin. And you are imposing that the gradient along the real line along the puncture is the curve you started with. This is strictly convex curve gamma. So Kuchiko Valesky will give you a system and uniqueness for this for this system. Okay? Well, you have recovered a solution, but now you want to prove that this function z you have constructed is in fact a solution of this PDE and also is a well defined function of the coordinates x and y. Recall you that this is the z, all this function depends on the coordinates u and v, and you got a well function depending on the coordinates x and y. Okay? And that's the work we are going to do next. You want to prove that z is a well function defined in terms of x and y. The first step to do that is to consider the Jacobian of the chain of parameters between x and y, and you compute, of course, this, this Jacobian is zero along this real line because all the real line is mapped into one point, into the origin. But you can compute the transversal derivative of j and you recover this expression here the modulus of the curve you started with times the curvature of this curve. Since you have imposed that gamma is regular, strictly convex, and negatively oriented, this quantity is immediately positive. So by inverse function theorem, you, you will have that this Jacobian is strictly positive on the upper half of the street. Okay. J is positive, so you have locally a graph. The change of coordinates is locally well defined. But you want to construct the fact a graph, not a local graph. You have a well defined graph. The last step in order to prove that we can pass from a local graph to a real graph, we'll use a little bit more geometry. We will use some techniques as the legendary transform. The point is that I want to mention here that uh, for a general monion per equation, the graph of our solution is not convex in R3, in general, close to the singularity, because the equation is more complicated. But from our solution, Z, we can sum a certain paraboloid. And work with a new function C hat, which is convex. And the limit gradient, as I said, it was to this function coincide with the original limit gradient. Okay? Later we use the transform, the legendary transform, and from our graph, or the graph of C hat, we obtain a graph also convex with boundary. The boundary is exactly the curve gamma, and which is tangent to this curve along the boundary. This is the normal. Okay? Here, using some theory about index of curves, we deduce that we cannot have a multigraph here. This is, it must be a graph because the index of this curve is equal to one. Okay? Well. And here is the, the uniqueness theorem, at least for the, for the classical monion per equation. Suppose that you have a solution of this monion per equation in a puncture disk with an isolated singularity. Then we have proven that the limit gradient is a strictly convex analytic uh, regular convex curve. Moreover, we can recover the solution using this limit gradient and using the system theorem. You have a, a solution, you know how it is its limit gradient and you can recover the solution. And if you have two solutions with co which has the same limit gradient, they must agree in a certain neighborhood of the puncture. You have uniqueness by the Kochiko-Valesky theorem. Okay? This, they, 
we have a classification in the case of the pure monion pair equation. So summarizing what we have obtained, it's the result I present to you at the beginning. If you fix a point in R3, I recall you, if you fix a point in the Euclidean space and you call M1 the class of all the solutions of the elliptic monion pair equation with an isolated singularity at this point, and M2 the class of all regular real analytic strictly convex Jordan curves in the plane, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two classes. Okay. This is at least in the case of the pure monion pair equation. And to finish, well, what, what about, what can we say about the general monion pair equation? Well, if your equation is more complicated, we in general don't have the classification theorem, but as, as I have said at the beginning, but we have seen that the system result is okay. We can construct solutions starting with a com strictly convex Jordan curve. This is true. Moreover, there is a result of Heinz and Bergestet that says if you impose certain technical restrictions on the coefficients, you can also prove that the associated conformal structure on the puncture disk is also of an annulus if the singularity is not removable. You need more hypotheses, but this is also true. Moreover, if you avoid, if you, if you do not permit that you have a cusp, if you impose that the slope of the, singular, the slope of the solution close to the singularity is bounded, you can also prove that the limit gradient is a regular convex Jordan curve, also for this more complicated case. And finally, if this uh, monion pair equation models the immersion or the, the embedding of a surface of, con of positive extrinsic curvature in the Euclidean space, the three sphere, or the hyperbolic space, this kind of embeddings will satisfy a monion pair equation of this type. If you are in this geometric situation, then the limit gradient is in fact also strictly convex. Here is convex, here is more, strictly convex. And in this case, you can recover plugging this, this limit gradient in the system result, you are going to be able to recover the solution. So, so in this last case, in this geometric case, you will have a classification. You can go and go back. Okay? Well, just, just to finish, uh, let, me, let me present to you how, how can, can we write the geometric application of these this final comments. Suppose that you, you have N3, the Euclidean space, the three sphere, or the hyper, hyperbolic space. Okay? Suppose that you have a domain in one of these three ambients, and you consider an analytic function positive K defined in this domain, and you fix a point inside this domain, P0. Okay? You call A1 the class of all the oriented, so canonically oriented, uh, just to fix an orientation. You consider all the surfaces uh, in this domain with this value of the extrinsic curvature. The extrinsic curvature more or less uh, measure how the, the surface is, is bent in these ambients. Okay? You consider the class of all the surfaces with this value k you have fixed for the curvature and then have a puncture at this point p0 you have fixed. And you call A2 the class of all the regular analytic strictly convex curves in the sphere. These curves here will play the role of the, li of the limit normal, unit normal at the punch. So you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two classes. Okay, the point is that, the point is that if you have a, a strinsic, positive extrinsic curvature surface in one of these ambient, you immediately can prove that it must be a graph and so you will have a solution of a general ammonia per equation. You apply all the machinery we have proven before, analytic ma machinery, and you can deduce, you can deduce this, this classification here. So uh, I think I will, I will stop here. Thank you very much.